Welcome to Thursdays for the Soul. I am your host, Reverend Dr. Chris Davies. Thursdays for the Soul is a predictable time of gathering for something to feed your spirit, offered by faith education, innovation, and formation, and the justice and local church ministries of the national setting of the United Church of Christ. Topics are wide ranging, focused on spirituality and care of people, prayer and worship, music, psalm readings, and compassionate teachings are involved. Today, we are here talking about cultivating resilience after collective trauma. And this webinar came into being from the idea of the Mesa team uh, and Reverend Elizabeth Dilley. Chris, thank you for that introduction. Um, the Ministerial Excellence Support and Authorization Ministry Team in the National Setting of the United Church of Christ quickly realized that um, even in the midst of the immediate um, moments in this pandemic, um, there was necessary support needed, but we also knew that there was going to be some longer term support that was needed and some practices um, of resilience that, that we needed our clergy and our lay folk to be engaging in now um, to ground them in the coming weeks and months. We were also aware that um, in the months and years to come that our clergy and other leaders are likely to be facing some sort of secondary trauma response um, after um, the initial big waves of this pandemic are behind us. And so we'd hoped to gather some speakers um, with experience in the field who could talk with us and share about that. So I'm so excited to introduce our panelists today. Um, first, um, she's known as the Justice Doula. Um, Mickey Scott Bay Jones is the Director of Healing and Resilience Initiatives with Faith Matters Network, which is a womanist led organization. Um, it's really an inspiration and an honor to have you with us, um, Mickey. What else would you like us to know about you as we begin? Sure, um, I am the Justice Doula and I um, primarily do work right now around the idea of movement chaplaincy. So if you think about chaplains in schools or hospitals, what does it look like to um, have chaplains in a social justice movement setting? So now I work with people on developing that concept and training chaplains. We launched the Daring Compassion um, Movement Chaplaincy Training and um, have now trained um, over a hundred folks and we'll start a new cohort in October. And so my real focus and obsession is how do we heal amidst the trauma um, that is happening in our world, um, which is why we then have movements of social justice. And how do we also build resilience? And that comes out of my personal um, experiences too. So I'm just obsessed with how do we survive? Um, how do we hold one, one another during this? And so that's my work in the world. And I'm glad to be here today to talk about that in the midst of the coronavirus epidemic and you know, the, the continuing social justice struggles that are still there, even while we're dealing with that trauma on top of it. Thank you so much. And Mickey, it also feels important to me to acknowledge that you're also a daughter in mourning right now, um, having lost your own mother to this virus. Um, so know that our hearts are with you and we thank you, especially in this time that you're with us. I also want to invite next um, Reverend Matt Krebin, who's been the lead pastor at the Newtown Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, since 2007. And since the events uh, at Sandy Hook Elementary School on December 14th, 2012, Reverend Krebin has worked with a broad coalition of faith leaders in Connecticut and nationally. Um, to build bridges of understanding, and to also promote gun safety violence and other initiatives. Reverend Krebin, we're so glad you're with us today. Thank you. Welcome for being here. 
Thank you. What, what, what else would you share about yourself? Um, well, thank you first for having me here. Um, it's really an honor to be a part of this um, gathering with uh, colleagues who really, I think, are can express so much of uh, the power of um, of the journey uh, that we're all on in in different ways and yet in similar ways. And that's really what kind of led me being involved after the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Uh, and the communal trauma that that caused. Uh, I've also spent a great deal of time working um, and connecting with uh, faith leaders who have been serving communities who've been affected by um, mass trauma events and also who minister in the midst of trauma, uh, oftentimes on a daily basis. Uh, and, and the more I learned about that and the more I engaged with conversation uh, out of that grew a a series of conversations that's online through Audia, uh, Odyssey Impact about healing the healers and um, and conversations with faith leaders about how we uh, move through trauma. And the more I was involved with this, the more I realized that trauma uh, for many of us who are faith leaders is something we don't always get a lot of a background and training in um, and uh, training, uh, you know, advanced training in seminary and other other settings. And so uh, I, I've always been now more recently in the last few years trying to encourage folks to, to learn more about trauma because all of us, I, you know, I was kind of thinking all of us will maybe minister in the midst of trauma at some point in our lives. And then this pandemic happened and really, you know, this really is a disaster. It's a mass disaster. It's impacting almost every one of our communities. And really it's dealing with complex traumatic grief, all, all the issues that a disaster has that includes um, how you deal with trauma. So, I think it's so important for us to have conversations like this to to talk about how we navigate this as as people of faith, as people who uh, are faith leaders, and as communities who are seeking to also care for our wider communities who, who are also experiencing uh, the trauma of this pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, we we're so grateful for your wisdom and. Although we certainly would not wish your experience on anyone, um, the way that you have led during that time has been a gift to so many people um, in the church and beyond. So thank you for that. Um, our, third our third panelist today um, is the National Coordinator of Proyecto Encuentros, Bienvenida y Gracia. And that is the Reverend Rina Ramos. Um, she's an ordained United Church of Christ minister who also leads an open and affirming Spanish speaking congregation in Oakland, California, and has done so since 2011. Um, Rina was born in El Salvador and grew up during the Civil War, and embedded in her heart is the voice of San Romero de las Americas, denouncing oppression from the pulpit. Reverend Ramos. It's really an honor also to have you with us today and for you to share your wisdom from your own experience. Thank you. Um, yeah, my hope is to be able to engage in conversation today about the ways in which we just not only survive pain and suffering, but how we find rebirth on all this um, to continue the fight for justice and peace and to continue uh, building communities. And so that is my hope today. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. I mean, even before, as we were gathering, I was saying just knowing um, all of that, of, of who you are and what you bring and the wisdom that you have for um, anyone listening now or listening to the recording thereafter is such a gift to the church. So I'm curious for those, um, because each of you have known trauma in different ways, and I'm curious, how is it in the midst of this that you are holding resilience now? Um, I'm gonna start with Rena. Um, Sure. Um, so, you know, if I understand resilience to be the way we transform um, trauma and transform those moments where our life goes upside down 
without us having any control on it. Uh, I had to say that for, for me, to be being able to reflect on that, how is that happening right now? It's, it's a privilege in and of itself because not many people have the time to reflect on how they are growing out of this experience. Many people I work with in the immigrant community, recently arrived immigrants, they are just trying to make it meeting their basic needs for shelter and for food. And in the midst of having lost jobs that were immediately cut on the stay in place uh, orders uh, or were or are in the process of uh, securing their asylum in this country. So um, resilience for me and reflecting on it and how me as a faith leader is going to go through it is a privilege in and of itself uh, to have that time and space. And the way I, I've been trying to cope with everything is um, remembering too where I come from. I, it's, it's very important to me to remember that I'm the survivor of the civil war a survivor of uh, immigrating myself uh, through the border. And those things mark me. Those things were not tattooing my skin, literally, but they were tattooing my soul. And so those things are reminders that I, there are other boundaries that I can cross. I, bo I cross borders, so I, I know how to cross those. Um, and, and that this is another moment in life where um, God is asking me to stay present. And that is what resilience is teaching me, is, is the moment, is the now, and there's no much I can do for the, um, in terms of like, what can I fix? in the future and out of my control is, is a staying present because one of the things that worries me a lot is the aftermath of this pandemic and the poverty that's going to invade our communities and the desperation and and if it's bad now how bad it's going to be once we come out of this um the communities that we serve or that I particularly serve, the Latinx immigrant community. So if I start thinking about that, um, the, how overwhelmed I can get uh, takes more energy than staying present. So staying present has been key to maintaining a sense of hope. And then uh, other tools that I have had is to reinvent the way I do is, uh, connecting with the community. We, we went online, uh, you know, mid-March and we've been connecting. And I understand we not only need to pray in the time that we have, the virtual time we have together, we have to move. So we have been employing music, we had a Latin dance class. We're gonna have yoga. We are. Uh, we had a concert of revolutionary music and music for the soul because it's anything that makes us feel alive in these moments. It's anything that is sparking us the happiness, happiness of being alive and, and remaining hopeful. Um, and having the time together to grieve because I know there are, um, I know for a fact because I've been following the, this, this uh, preachers in the Spanish immigrant community who are teaching to repress the feelings of sadness, who are teaching people not to feel these things because that means you're not grateful to God or you're not faithful enough. And so 
that to me doesn't build resilience. That is just repressing feelings that are gonna come out somehow, some way. And so having the time, allowing the gentleness of a, a broken heart is also a way to build resilience. Thank you so much. You lifted up so many different strategies in there. I heard moving your body and having time for all of the feelings as they arrive and drawing from the strength of your own experiences and the strength of those who have gone before. Um, I want to take the same question to both, uh, to both Matt and Mickey. How is it that you are holding resilience now? So Matt first, then Mickey. Sure, thanks. I mean, I think you've heard a lot of stuff um, that was mentioned there. For me, as I mentioned, um, uh, I really had a journey after Sandy Hook Elementary School for a few years where I was trying to figure all this stuff out, um, even in the midst of trying to minister to my community. And out of that, uh, the more and more I learned, the more I realized um, that my journey was really a journey of resilience all the time. Time. So when people talk about this time as being a time, it's it's more stressful and anxious. I've had to learn all kinds of new skills, the things I didn't. But but for me, for the last you know uh, seven years, but really five plus years, I've really had to do a lot of work. So uh, uh, on practicing my uh, ways to help myself navigate through what's ongoing experience for me of, of uh, the impact of trauma. So uh, there's kind of common statements we say uh, in trauma work that the body leads the mind, the body calms the mind. Uh, and some of the things you're just hearing, uh, it's, I mean, it's one of the great good news I heard after, after our, my experience in Newtown after the shooting was people said, uh, experts who came in and talked with us and, 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 and shared with us said, you know, the church has a lot of things that actually doesn't, then we don't even realize we do that really helps people, uh, in the midst of trauma, um, music, dance, uh, praying, meditation, um, you know, regulating, you know, we, things we do that regulate the body. Um, I've been walking regularly. I joked, uh, before kind of in our pre-conversation with uh, with the panelists here, you know, I got a dog uh, a while ago and she could walk 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and she would not be tired. So she needs to be walked all the time. Um, and I take a long walk with her in the morning and every evening. Um, and I need to do that. You know, it regulates, my, for me, it regulates my mind. It doesn't mean it work for everybody else. One of the things I've also learned is that what works for me may not work for somebody else. Uh, different experiences, different contexts, all kinds of different things are going to be needed. But but those kinds, there are things that that help me, and that that's what's helped me. And uh, one of the stories I tell is, even though I think I've got this down, like oh, I've been doing this for five years, and this is a high stress situation, but I'm good. But I remember early on when we just had to uh, be sheltered in place here in the um, tri-state area where I'm up in, you know, Connecticut still. So we were kind of early on with the uh, explosion of, uh, of cases and we were not too far. We were the earliest county in Connecticut with cases. So um, there's just a lot going on. I was watching the news. Uh, I had my church where I was trying to figure things out. And, you know, I, I'm here and I'm ready to tell people, oh, you must be an expert on this. You know how to do this every day. Well, I don't know how to do this every day. And, and my body was getting away from my, my mind was, you know, just the stress, anxiety, everything else was there. My wife happened to say, hey, we have a bunch of weeds. We have to pull, you know, some weeds. I'm going to go out for an hour and pull weeds. You want to come? I go, I don't have time to pull weeds. I got to go. And then I went out and I pulled weeds. And guess what? Like pulling weeds for an hour, um, I was breathing, you know, hard. Uh, I just, it just changed my whole, my my whole disposition um, because again, my body was kind of just out of its, what, what I was in. My mind was just going through all kinds of cycles that even though I kind of know it, sometimes I forget it. So, um, so that was you know, powerful for me to, to be reminded that uh, sometimes we all need that. Um, and so, you know, for me, um, for now, uh, the last four or five years in our church, we do yoga three times. We offer yoga to the whole community three times a week. We do 
a lot of different things in our church because we community have, continue to have a community that's been experiencing collective trauma and grief and people that, that really need different ways that, that weren't always being addressed. So we subsidize uh, opportunities for people to kind of use their body to help regulate the mind and help you know, calm the mind. So that's just a few thoughts. So um, I'll start by acknowledging something um, Reverend Rena said um, in, ex in kind of telling her experience of uh, being an immigrant and having um, lived through a civil war is that some of us are, um, have been dealing with trauma for a long time. So some of us have both generational trauma that we actually carry in our bones and quite literally carry in um, DNA that has been changed by the trauma and stress. Um, and then in our own lifetimes, it is compounded by the trauma um, of living as a black indigenous or person of color, an immigrant, a queer person. And so some of us have been living with that trauma um, our entire lives, whether we know it or not. And then, um, and, and then additional trauma is whatever trauma um, we experienced um, or perceived in our lives as, as children um, and as we continue to grow. Um, and then you put a pandemic on top of it, right? So, um, and then we have collective trauma of a pandemic and then we have the individual trauma of how that pandemic then um, is impacting our families disproportionately because our bodies are already, as the book is called, keeps the score, our bodies are already keeping the score. Um, and so, but that trauma is often not acknowledged. Um, it is sometimes seen as bad behavior, right? Um, so when that trauma shows up in um, disordered relationships, it's considered bad behavior. When that trauma shows up in health issues, it's pre-existing conditions. Um, it's um, being overweight um, and, and then things like that that we consider someone's character issues, right? So, um, so in acknowledging that we have these kind of different levels or different um, intersections or compounding of trauma, um, that is uh, in a lot of ways, it's very difficult to hear and it can be very discouraging. On the other hand of that, we also have um, generations and life experience of uh, some levels of resilience and healing for that trauma. Um, so are there are ways that our, that our bodies carry wisdom, that our brains and hearts carry wisdom um, that we may not be aware of, but that it resides in us that we can then you know, mine that for that information. There are ancestors and elders who have um, lessons in resilience that we can, um, you know, we can find that wisdom. And so that is where for me, I have tried to continually go back to. It's helpful for me to realize that I'm not the first one, that my community is not the first one, that even us in the US, we are not the first to be dealing with um, a, 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 a communal trauma and then trauma upon trauma. Um, I have been thinking about, you know, and I've seen a few articles float around but been thinking about like, what was it like to live through the 1918 flu? Um, what, what can we learn from communities who survived through yellow fever? Like, right, so what, are, what could I possibly learn from, um, and for me particularly, for black folks who lived through that, right? So, um, so that's where I'm trying to learn from is my own body's wisdom for sure. Um, because in past times of trauma, like for me, um, like the uh, other two have said, um, moving my body um, is a lifesaver for me. So I know that that's something I have to do. Um, I know I have to be reminded to eat and drink. So even reminding my friends, I have friends on Twitter who, ha who will just, you know, tweet out a reminder today. Have you had anything to eat today? Have you had a full glass of water? If not, stop and go do that, right? So remembering those things that I need to do just to keep my body running on a minimum basis. Um, and then again, going back to that kind of more ancient wisdom of um, whether it's people I actually share a bloodline with, whether it's um, ancient wisdom of my um, faith, but how do we um, kind of gather the deep wells of wisdom 
Um, one of my favorite images is of Sankofa, the Sankofa bird, which has its neck um, back towards its backwards, picking up an egg of wisdom and then pulling it forward. Um, not just getting that wisdom, but how do we then innovate with that? How do we meet the demands of today with that wisdom of the past? So that has been um, comforting to me to know that there is something that I can pull um, from the past because of the resilience of people who have had to live through disease and um, uh, questionable leadership and all kinds of things before um, that we are meeting in this moment in a different way, for sure. This is our time and our trauma and what we're going through. But there are lessons um, and, and sometimes it's the actual lesson like, oh, these people formed you know, these kinds of networks, which we're now calling mutual aid networks. Okay. And then sometimes it's like, um, I just know that they get, they got out of bed, that I have somebody in my lineage, um, that was, you know, an enslaved person who somehow got out of bed every day. I am going to somehow imagine that person and find the resolve to get out of bed this morning. Um, so it's those kinds of of things, both practical and kind of a spiritual imagined um, bouts of wisdom that I try to pull from on a daily basis. Amen to that. As you're thinking about where we draw wisdom to cultivate this resilience, I'm curious if you have any advice for the people that are watching. You know, these folk are, are pastors and leaders and seekers trying, you know, what is it? What gem of advice of you know, your lived experience would you offer to them in the midst of all of this? Well, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, that's not gonna, I don't know that it's a popular one, but actually like do less. I think we actually, <laughs> have to I shouldn't um, be on zoom right, all these hours right, right. <laughs> like uh say no um I said no to an interview in Newsweek this morning because I didn't I was in bed and I didn't want to do it um so saying no um putting relationship over production of things the one of the things I saw very early on with pastors bringing things online was this need to produce, produce, produce. Oh, wow. We have to figure out how we can, you know, reproduce the church service in the, in the chapel oh, wow. online. And I'm like, how about you don't do that? <laughs> what I think people really are needing and wanting and like hunger, hungry for is connection. So how do you really major on connection? And as the services come, we'll figure that out. But how do we really major on connection? So kind of going back to some of those basic needs, human connection, again, have you eaten today? Have you had something liquid in your body? Um, you know, how are you kind of meeting those basic needs? And then we'll fit everything else in around that. So going back to those basic measures of wisdom, because you got to have your body wisdom intact first and then that relational wisdom intact um, so that you have people to check in with and and kind of going from there I'm looking around I'm like have I actually <laughs> have I eaten today <laughs> I mean this is all of us right there's a, there's there's so many truths um, and I also know that it's impacting every single one of us differently and Matt I know I'm, I want to invite you to speak to that because I know that you bring um, that awareness in such a deep level. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the things that I do tell people, and, and it was our experience here, even though we had a really common, um, you know, uh, trauma event that you would say, oh, everybody's experiencing the same thing. Well, no, people aren't experiencing the same thing. Uh, we had to be really clear early on and give people permission um, to be really in different places. Um, I think one of the hardest things when you're going through uh, traumatic events and traumatic experiences is that very often, even in families, you know, people will be feeling like, why aren't you experiencing this the same way I'm experiencing this? Uh, and you either are angry with the other person or, or um, feel um, 
isolated or or separate because you know it feels and you know, we find this in in traumatic experiences where people kind of feel as if if we don't if we're not feeling the exact same things or experiencing the exact same ways that somehow there must be a disconnect and that's really part of our human experience and part of it is in our communities is giving people permission to give each other permission to bring whatever experiences they have and to honor that kind of sacred space and we, that's kind of common when we talk about that in the church we try to at least i think especially at the ucc we talk about that a lot but sometimes we forget that too is in giving people that kind of permission to to recognize that we're in different places um uh is somebody described it to me you know that you could be in the same chapter of the book but you're on different pages um and i, I think that that's really what was helpful i mean some of the resources though that i think are really important that the church brings in this time as wisdom is really storytelling i've been impressed by how many people are telling stories you know how many you know like we have this but there's all kinds of people doing story hours and story times both in churches and beyond. I think we understand that we really need, especially in these times, um, stories that some of which, you know, are not necessarily like, this is directly applicable to everything that's going on, but um, there's a way in which I think people wanna be a part of a story and connect through storytelling. And I think that's one of the resources we have as a church is we have stories that we tell both from our sacred texts and in other places. And we need to continue to share those stories, tell, you know, be storytellers. Um, I mean, the only thing I also describe to people is my experience with people, especially in the midst of, of trauma um, and disasters, is that most people aren't looking for meaning as much as they're looking for purpose. Uh, we sometimes think that we as faith people have to say, let me give you all, you know, I'm going to sum all this up and tell you all the meaning of what this is. Uh, and and for most people, nobody, you can't cognitively get your head around if you're in the midst of trauma, what's going on? What you really need is what, what is my purpose? You know, what can I do to feel that I have some um, control, some power, some sense of, of my own ability to have something that I can regulate and have some um, control over? Um, and that, that's really important to empower people, to give people purpose um, in our ministries, uh, to help them not to feel as if they're just kind of waiting for whatever is happening to just overwhelm them. And so um, I think those two things are really important keys, at least from my experience uh, in my journey. I want to pick up on that storytelling piece because a lot of the trauma literature that I've been reading is 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 pointing to the fact that on the other side of this, even as we're going through it and on the other side of it, so much of it is helping people tell their own stories of the experience. Um, and you're mentioning the stories of our faith that can be woven in the midst of all of that too. Um, to me, there's a link there to some of the storytelling that's happening about trauma, which is toxic. You know, some of the storytelling that's happening about with our theology, uh, with theology in general, I'm not gonna say our theology, but with theology in general, that is actually detrimental to folk because of that storytelling. And Rina, you mentioned that earlier, um, but I wanna invite you to kind of speak more about that in this space. I think you are referring to the fact that the, I have been witnessing uh, Spanish speaking preachers saying that it's okay to suffer and it's okay if you die because you're gonna go end up in heaven. And as, as someone was saying in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, if we were to ask the dead uh, relatives if they wanna come back to earth, they will say no, because now we're walking on on the golden streets of heaven. And, and I was just so furious, you know, looking at Facebook Live and this, and this preacher and like, what do you, you don't know, you don't know. And you don't know the suffering of the families that are losing probably the, the sole breadwinner, the, the person who, who the whole family depended on or, or not even that, the person that they just, they just needed it more um, time with. And, and so um, contra-arresting this, this theology is hard because 
I know for my experience, when I when I present myself as an open lesbian ordained minister in Latinx communities, some places will will sort of see me, but some places will immediately label me as a fake pastor because how can I be a lesbian and be a Christian? So contrasting the messages and this theology in these settings is a very hard thing to do. But I do know that more and more there are uh, Spanish speaking Latinx Christians out there who are doing a more compassionate, encompassing gospel that is bringing the news of uh, we are love and we are divine no matter who you are. So I'm, I, I think that that's how it's going to happen by many people saying it out loud. I think for me, sometimes I get shy with this message. Sometimes I feel I'm not going to be heard because I already lost my uh, authority by being who I am and moving in those spheres where who I am is not valid. So is, is believing first that I have a that authority as, as a cis man uh, who uh, stands in the pulpit um, upholding patriarchy. So um, first is that. Um, and I also think it's super important to uplift the voices of the young people that are in our congregations because they do know better. I feel that young people are, are, are trying to make this world better. Uh, I'm trying to, I worked with young people for years when I was working for the Genders and Sexualities Alliance Network. And they were mostly high schoolers who were teaching me how they dare to live authentically every day. And so in that authenticity, sometimes we're not going to convince people around us, but the fact that we are living in freedom will be very inspiring and exciting for other people to watch when we don't have to hide any piece of who we are, then I think that that is very inviting. And some people are not ready to change their minds and it's okay. Amen to that. I think there's so much power in imagining. I mean, there's power in imagining the future that we have not yet been able to create. We have to be able to imagine it, to create it. Our, the stories of our faith, say that, the activist and wisdom teachers that I am aware of uh, lean into that. And there, there's this, this uh, I'm thinking particularly of, uh, I think Grace Lee Boggs said it first, and then a major, uh, Adrian Marie Brown leaned into that in her emergent strategy work. With that awareness, for the three of you, I wanna lift up a question that someone offered, which is what are the wisdom sources and the scriptures that you lean into for resilience and that you would uh, offer so that they can share it out. So uh, let's uh, succinctly, because um, I want to also allow a chance for you to bless everyone on the way out. Um, Virina, maybe you first. Who's first? Me? You? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. All right. Uh, so what, one um, sermon that I've been recycling a lot, because I've been using it a lot, is the one where Jesus is saying to the disciples, I will give you this peace, know how the word gives you the, this peace. Quiet your heart and don't let it, um, I, I don't know what the word is in English, but don't let it be trouble. I think that would translate to that. Uh, and I, I just think that it's a beautiful scripture because it's saying to all of us, don't believe politicians, 
Don't believe those in power. That's not the type of peace I'm gonna live with you. It's a peace that defies reason because it comes from me, from Jesus. And so it's a peace in which you can trust. And then when I think of a troubled heart, I always think of water that gets tainted with like sand and you cannot see clearly. So I, that's what I think of a heart that is not being quiet down and just the image of having the sood, soothing presence of God on, on our hearts is something I've been holding on to. So that's my scripture. Um, I don't, um, I, I feel like I get things from so many sources, but, um, uh, and I have a lot of teachers that I'm very thankful for, um, from my children to, um, mentors, um, like Mama Ruby Sales or, um, Reverend Jackie Lewis, um, so sometimes it's just a snippet of something they say, or it's um, going back to some you know piece of writing that is um, really helpful for me. So I think um, that's an important thing is is diving back into your teachers when you uh, you know going through something like this. Not saying you have to read a whole book, but going back to those places you've highlighted and you know earmarked and things like that. Um, it's so important to do those kinds of things um, and revisit the places that you're that have already guided you, but you're going to find new um, roads, um, new pathways when you go back through them. Um, so for me, it's vis revisiting some of those womanist teachers. I always revisit the work of Alice Walker um, because that's such a source for me. Um, and um, I think I've also been trying to sit with poetry. Um, there's a collection of poets, of poems on um, kind of grief and loss that was collected by Kevin Young. Um, and so that was recommended to me and has been a, a very helpful source. Um, and then um, recently the Black Trans Prayer Book was released and there's a, a, a section in the back that has some mantras and one of them is, my grief reminds me I'm alive. My grief reminds me I'm alive. And so that, um, just that one line, there's a lot more to that section, but that one line has for me been a whispered prayer throughout the day, um, especially in moments that feel um, thicker or heavier. Um, I just repeat that to myself. Wow, there's so many places we could go. I, what struck me when you first asked the question was, I remembered the first Sunday we went, we moved to um, online worship. And, and the big thing going into that week was, well, because you know, we usually ourselves, our, our congregation, follows the lectionary most of the time, but we also say, hey, if something comes up, don't make the lectionary, you know, don't serve the lectionary. Let, you know, let the calling of the day serve you in terms of what the message is. But that Sunday happened to be, you know, a piece of scripture from the lectionary that was the story of the people, uh, the Hebrew children in, uh, in the wilderness, uh, and saying, why did we come out here? Uh, you know, we're just all going to die and uh, we're thirsty. There's no water. And that was when, you know, uh, God, you know, Moses is all mad and, and, but God doesn't seem to be that mad. God gets mad. And, and part of that story, you know, different times in this encounter with this, with the people, but there God just kind of says, go out in front of them, take some of the elders, be vulnerable in essence and go and go to the rock, strike the rock. I'm going to give them water. I'm going to give them what they need. Um, and for me, that day was like, you know, this is provision. And what strikes me about that story is not just the story is provision, but what strikes me about that story is I have to remind people 
the is the Hebrew children, you know, the Israelites told that story. They wrote that story down. They had remembered it, but they, from what we can tell, they wrote it down when they were in Babylon. So they were telling that story years and years later about their experience then. And that's why I say storytelling is so powerful, you know, that they were retelling their story, remembering it. And that story is not like a pretty, you know, it's not like the story of, hey, we were so great and we did awesome. Um, it was like, man, things, you know, we were, didn't know what was going on. And, and yet somehow in the midst of that, God uh, provides and that God sustains. And so that's, you know, one kind of thing for me, it's always reminding me how much often scriptures are told, you know, the scriptures we have are, are telling stories that were remembered years and years later were written down because, and not because they were these perfect stories of perfect people. And the other stories that we've been, we extended Easter. I mean, I know we're in Easter tide, but we kept telling, the last number of weeks, we've been telling the resurrection story, all the different resurrection stories. Um, and we haven't been telling because, again, I, I think the church has so missed out on, we, much of the church at least, I think, and sometimes at least for, in my, in my own tradition, and in terms of, you know, how people have approached worship and things like that is, I think collectively, sometimes the church thinks we have resurrection down you know, like we know resurrection, you know, and the resurrection stories are like, what the heck is going on? You know, who is this person showing up? Is that really him? Is that what's going? It's this, you know, it's a reminder to us that, you know, even resurrection is not this thing that somehow magically solves all of the challenges that are before God's people. Resurrection tells the story of this strange, crazy encounters that kind of are, are there. And then suddenly, you know, Jesus is gone and they didn't recognize him. And, and, you know, he asked these questions about Peter, will you feed my, you know, will feed my sheep if you love me. And, you know, it's, and you, and you kind of realize that these resurrection stories are also, you know, aren't for people that have it all figured out. They're, they're stories we tell because we're still trying to get our head around what's going on in our world. And, I mean, I think they're great stories to be telling right now because none of us can get our head around what's totally going on in the midst of our grief, our struggle, the, the challenges that are happening here. And yet somehow God keeps and Christ keeps showing up. Um, and as soon as we think we have a handle on it, God is gone again. God, you know, and Jesus isn't going to be just kind of there for you and me to to pull out when we feel we want to be show how faithful we are or how smart we are or how strong we are or how we've conquered everything in our lives and I mean so that you know that's that's where we've been I've been using those stories just to kind of you know as a means for us to really realize that it's okay to know that we don't know what's going to happen I mean I'm I, I think it's really dangerous and disastrous to tell people um, to tell people like it, things are going to be okay. You know, in Newtown, people thought if we made it through the first year, it'll be better. And then a lot of people at the second year anniversary said the second year was worse than the first year. Cause I thought if I made it through the first year, the second year would be better. And it was worse because I thought it would be better. And people were telling me a lot of people that didn't really know were telling folks, Oh, it'll get better it's really dangerous to tell people that things are going to get better. Um, I can tell them that God loves them. I can tell them that I believe in a grace that sustains us no matter what, but to tell you that from day to day, things are going to be better. Um, I think that's uh, at least from my, out of my experience, that's, that's less than helpful and actually it harmed a lot of folks. Uh, so I think it's really important to, to know that stories can tell us a lot, but they also can't, you know, I think as you're uh, reading it's talk about, you know, sometimes the church has been this place of of what I would consider theological abuse, you know, that tells people that we aren't going to talk about suffering, we're going to ignore it, we're not going to, we're going to see people as human beings who, you know, uh, need to know that they're lo loved and beloved for who they are, even in the midst of not, uh, of having lives that, that feel really shattered and broken. Um, it's not that you put all those pieces together. It's that that they that they know in the midst of that that there's the presence of a love that sustains us. So, um, you know, those are just my my thoughts. 
your thoughts and, and your, your edging into, I'm wondering if, if Matt, you can start, but what blessing, what hope do you have for the people who are watching, whether here with us now or watching in the recording? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, that this is a real challenging time. I mean, I think you heard from some of the conversations that we said that, you know, and for many of our communities, um, and many of our longer term stories, trauma is nothing new. You know, trauma is something that's been a part of, of people's lives um, for, you know, probably since the beginning of, of humankind. Uh, uh, and there's bad news in that. The bad news is that as human beings, both through kind of natural occurrence and through how we treat one another, we manage to be traumatized in all kinds of ways. Um, and and miss the, the point of what I think is the essence of the gospel that every single one of us is made in the image of God and is beloved, regardless of who we are, where we come from or anything else. And, um, and the challenge for us is that disasters bring out the dysfunction. You know, if systems and structures have been dysfunctional before, don't think a disaster is going to somehow <laughs> make it better it's going to just highlight how bad it is and it, it's opportunity but that and that's the that's the second thing that for me that's the hope is that it's opportunities for us in the midst of times like this to really say what do we want to try to be about as as god's people and uh what do we see as opportunity you know there's a lot of challenges for the church i know a lot of churches and some of my colleagues and pastors who aren't sure will we be will we be around as the church we you know as a church our church particularly. I, my, the good news for me is I think the church will be here, you know, um, in some way, she, you know, it is here. We already faith. are the church, the right? We're there here. already, right? But but that, you know, that, that the church as we do it is probably not going to come back to what it was, you know, and some of that's a blessing, you know. I always think of uh, Walter Brueggemann talking about the, prop, the, the, the prophetic word, uh, the prophets, and Brueggemann said, the prophets said, you know, the church, the, the, the world you've been carefully preparing for is being taken away from you by the grace of God. Uh, that sometimes we think we're preparing this world the way we're gonna control it. And, and the word of the prophets is that no, God is taking that away so that the world that really you, you really need and desire can come into being. So I think that's our opportunity now, but I think um, it's not something that's just gonna happen. You know, it's gonna happen because of people like you know, people doing far better work than me, people on this panel who are, you know, making a big difference in the lives of, of what it means to be the community of God in this time and place and, and what it might be in the future. So, you know, I think that that's, you know, that, that's if we hang on to, to those kind of images and we understand. Uh, the only other thing I would really just say, and I'll close real fast, but is, which is we have talked about trauma a lot. I also emphasize to people that the brain, the portions of the brain that get impacted by trauma, studies suggest that, that periods of high stress and anxiety, the exact same places in the brain um, are impacted in very similar ways. So people don't have to be traumatized to actually, you know, to actually kind of cognitively have all the challenges that can come from traumatizing experiences, um, just periods of extended stress and anxiety can lead to very similar outcomes. Um, and so you don't wanna also discount that people sitting in a lot of stress and anxiety that may not have direct impacted trauma aren't experiencing things pretty profoundly themselves. So it's really important for us to be aware of that and to, to minister to all kinds of folks and, and to not assume that, that people are just gonna be um, uh, you know, sometimes resilience is used as a word. Somebody asked about what's resilience, and sometimes resilience is a word. You know, we use it sometimes with kids and stuff. Oh, kids are resilient, or people are resilient. Um, resilience is something that we can help create and encourage, but we shouldn't just assume it's a natural state of being. Uh, and so, the opportunity here is how do we help communities and individuals to find resilience through through community. The good news is the church has done that even when we haven't realized it. You know, trauma is something, as we said, it's been around for a long time. The church has had a lot of antidotes to trauma, but we haven't named them a lot of times. At least from out of my experience, people hadn't named them. They hadn't realized that what we were doing was helping people 
through trauma, we just kind of were doing what we thought was church. Um, but if we can be more intentional, I think we can be much more helpful. Thank you so much, Matt. Rina, what blessing or offering do you have for the folks listening? Blessing for all of us is to um, find laughter um, often. Uh, find that by joy of even in the abs absurdity of life. Uh, you know, I, I know that one of the things I do to find laughter is that I watch a lot, a lot of telenovelas at night. When I want to disconnect, the more drama, the more I can laugh because I'm like, oh my God, look at that. And sometimes I try to imitate how much crying goes on the novelas, you know, like I, like I have, like I want to act it out. And I mean, anything that can bring those moments when there is lightness in, 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 in your life uh, because uh, uh, the, there is a saying in Espanol, this is las, pan, las penas con pan son buenas. And it means that with bread, everything is okay. Uh, and I believe that we cannot deprive ourselves of things that are gonna bring us that, that moment of happiness that we're going to need, even if it's temporary, that one cookie, don't, don't be kind to yourself, give to yourself whatever is gonna be suiting for you at this moment. Let it be part of your spiritual practice. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mickey, what from you? Uh, I um, listen to a lot of hymns um, as my mother was dying. Um, we made a playlist of um, just hymns that we thought she liked and would also just be soothing to us as um, she had her last days and um, we were saying goodbye. And um, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness is one of those. Um, I'm not usually someone who's listening to a bunch of hymns, um, more likely to have a Beyonce playlist going, but um, that was one of the ones that um, that we, we had on and in rotation was great as thy faithfulness and the, so the blessing that's coming up for me is um, hope for today and um, no it's strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow and so this you know a blessing for daily strength to get through what you have to get through now and maybe it's not a bright hope maybe it's a dim hope for tomorrow, but that it, uh, that we have what we need um, measured out to get through each day that is before us, um, because we don't know how long this is going to last, which is part of the stress and anxiety and trauma of this moment is that we don't know how long it's going to last, which is why I think so many people are desperate to get back to something because we want it to be over. Um, and without some clear guidance, because there is, uh, in some ways, there is no clear guidance to give, right? We, you cannot say um, a, a pandemic is going to be over next Thursday at 6 p.m. Um, and so, you know, like, um, and it, I know some people are trying. <laughs> right. And it, and it also then feels really um, uh, stressful and just horrible to say, buckle up for two years. Right. Um, but that is what we might be looking at is two years of a very different world and then the world that comes after that. And so I think we have to have some sort of, um, understanding of how to, you know, have some strength for just this day and then some spots of hope or strength for the coming days, um, and weeks and months and years ahead. And so that would be the blessing and prayer that I have for others. That's such a great lead in to what I've now begun to think of as the call to offering and announcements, which is um, if, if this has meant something to you, if this is work that um, is helpful for you and your ministries and you wanna support work like this, you can text UCC to 41444, which goes into the annual fund to support programs like this. 
And this announcement, which is on Tuesday, we are going to have another webinar on the science of return. So to what Mickey was saying just now about all of this stuff kind of swirling and how to distill it, we're setting up Tuesday to be a webinar where you can come, the leaders in your church can come, and we, you can share the recording of that thereafter as well if you're not able to make it. Um, and a week from today, um, the writers of the words from her mouth will be on and reading the, the modern Psalters from the new Pilgrim Press book. So all of this is upcoming. And it is with extreme gratitude that I am positioned to the three of you, Reverend Matt, Reverend Rena, and Justice Doula Mickey. Thank you for all that you are offering for us and for those who will watch thereafter. Um, and I uh, would ask Mickey, would you please close us in prayer and center us into the rest of our day? Hmm. Yes, I would be honored. If you'll um, find whatever prayer posture is meaningful for you as we pray together. Mother, Father, Creator, God, We believe, help our unbelief. We believe that you are with us. Help our unbelief when we don't feel it and we don't know it. May we be there for one another in the ways that we can in these moments of stress and anxiety and trauma and pain. May we be that mirror of the divine to one another, that we may accompany each other in spirit and in struggle. We pray for extra accompaniment and strength to those who are sick, to those who are dying, and to the families and communities of those who have transitioned from this world to the next. Help us to meet our own and each other's practical needs as a spiritual discipline. And we pray for those who continue to risk their lives to serve others. Help us to love each other enough to wear our masks, to wash our hands, and to stay physically distant, but not emotionally distant, not spiritually distant. Help us to lead with love. It's in the name of Jesus and your many other names by which you are loved and called that we pray. Amen. Ashe. Let it be so. Amen.